In this video, we are going to begin talking about ways that scientists go about determining the structures of organic molecules by going through and outline an overview of some of the key techniques that are used for determining complete structures of organic molecules. These techniques are super useful because generally we don't know at the onset when we have a substance, what its chemical structure actually is. For example, the compound in the lower left corner of your screen is the cancer drug called Taxol. It was isolated originally from a tree. And in order for scientists to know what the structure of that molecule was, it had to be isolated and subject to the types of tools that we'll be talking about in the next couple of modules in order to piece together all of the carbon-carbon bonds within the molecule, all the heteroatoms that are present, and everything else about this very complex structure. Additionally, we need these tools for determining organic structures to be confident about what we have synthesized in organic reactions. Throughout the Organic 1 class, we spend a lot of time talking about organic reactions and predicting the major organic products of those reactions. But in reality, rather than just predicting the structures of organic products, in order for those compounds to be useful, we need to be able to confirm that we have indeed synthesized that predicted product. And so these analytical tools are very useful for those types of applications as well. So over the course of the next two modules, what we'll be doing is walking through a variety of tools for determining the structures of organic molecules so that by the end of the next few modules, you'll be comfortable at interpreting the types of spectral data that are shown in this slide here, where we have an IR spectrum, a mass spectrum, and an NMR spectrum all shown. And right now, these all probably look rather similar to you and you quite possibly can't really make any information about anything out from these spectra. But by the end of the next two modules, the goal is that you will understand this. And keep in mind that modules can be thought of as synonymous with chapters. So in the module this week, we will have some videos that deal with infrared spectroscopy, or IR for short, and mass spectrometry, MS for short. We will go into relatively limited detail about these two techniques. And then next week, we'll focus on NMR spectroscopy, nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, which is going to be a extremely valuable tool for piecing together the connections between the atoms and the molecule to come up with complete chemical structures. And in general, IR, mass spectrometry, and NMR are used together in order to piece together the structure of complex organic molecules. So let's take a look at an overview of these three main types of tools that we will use to determine structures of organic molecules and look at what each one measures and the key pieces of information that each will provide. So we will go ahead and look at those three main tools that I just mentioned, that is IR, MS, and NMR. And I'm going to go ahead and write out and spell these out for you for your notes. So in the current module, the chapter 12 module, what we'll focus on is IR, which is infrared spectroscopy. Because infrared spectroscopy, as the name implies here, is looking at the infrared region of the electromagnetic spectrum. And we'll talk about some features of molecules that can be determined based on measuring how they interact with the infrared region of the electromagnetic radiation range. We will also, in this chapter, the chapter 12 module, talk about mass spectrometry. Which we abbreviate as MS for short, much like we abbreviate IR as just IR. And then in the following module, the chapter 13 module, we'll focus on nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And since nuclear magnetic resonance is quite a mouthful there, we'll abbreviate that as NMR spectroscopy. What we will do in this video is 
walk through each of these just to give an overview of what is measured by each and the key info to illustrate how these three different tools will provide complementary information about the structure of a molecule in order to enable you to determine the complete connectivity between atoms, all the functional groups that are present, where those are present within a molecule, and a symbol, a complete chemical structure for a compound. So the key pieces of information that we're going to look at here as we talk about these three main tools is we are going to create a table here so that we can highlight what each tool will measure. In other words, what physical or chemical property is being measured in each case. And then by measuring that key physical or chemical property, what information do we gain? In other words, how does that measurement enable us to determine features of the chemical structure of the molecule? So in terms of the IR spectroscopy, what IR is going to measure is the bond vibrations in response to being subjected with electromagnetic radiation that is in the infrared region. So it's measuring bond vibrations in response to infrared radiation. And what is the case with IR is that it's been found that when molecules are subject to infrared radiation, that specific functional groups will absorb infrared radiation at certain wavelengths and hence certain frequencies. And this particular absorption corresponds to molecular bond vibrations. And so that's why we're saying that we're measuring bond vibrations in response to infrared radiation because certain functional groups and the bonds there in those functional groups will will possess specific vibrations where the bonds are stretching and compressing much like a spring in response to infrared radiation. And the specific bonds within specific functional groups will vibrate at specific frequencies and wavelengths of that infrared spectrum range. And so the information that is going to be provided by an IR spectrum is generally going to center around information about specific functional groups because it's been empirically determined that specific functional groups absorb in the infrared region at specific wavelengths. And so we'll be looking at that a bit more in upcoming videos about how we can look at an IR spectrum and pick out what functional groups are present within that particular molecule. So the key thing you need to keep in mind with regard to IR spectroscopy is that we're using bond stretching and compressing, meaning bond vibrations within the infrared region to deduce what functional groups are present in the molecule because certain functional groups vibrate at certain frequencies within the IR range. Mass spectrometry, on the other hand, is quite a different animal than IR spectroscopy. What mass spectrometry is going to measure is the mass to charge ratio of ions. So I'm gonna show this as the mass to charge ratio. So that's why I'm putting the colon between mass and charge to illustrate that we're measuring the mass to charge ratio of ions. And the symbol that we used to abbreviate that we're measuring the mass to charge ratio, meaning mass divided by charge is M for the mass and Z for the charge. So you'll commonly see the abbreviation M over Z to represent that we are measuring the mass to charge ratio, that we have determined the mass spectrum of a particular ion. Now, a key term that we see here is the term ion, which you may be saying to yourself, well, most of the organic molecules that we've looked at that are stable final products are not ions, but instead they are molecules that have no formal charge. And so what we'll find for mass spectrometry is that in order to determine the mass spectrum for a molecule, we have to subject it to an environment that will enable it to form ions by gaining a proton or losing a proton, for example. And so we will talk in the mass spectrometry video about how we go about creating ions out of the molecules they work with so that we can measure the mass to charge ratio of 
those compounds, of those ions. And then the info that's provided by measuring this mass to charge ratio, the key info we will gain about the molecule is its molecular weight we will be able to infer. So I'm going to abbreviate molecular weight as MW. And the way that we'll be able to infer that is we can predict when we create an ion, whether that ion was created by picking up a proton or losing a proton, and hence we can deduce from that information what the molecular weight of the compound is with the extra proton that it confers the formal charge to allow it to be an ion, or with the loss of a proton that would cause it to be an anion, and we can use that information to infer the actual molecular weight of the compound as well. Finally, nuclear magnetic resonance, arguably the most powerful of these three tools for determining the complete structure of the molecules, is going to measure the response of the nuclear spin to a magnetic field. When we say nuclear spin, we're referring to the nucleus of the atom. This has nothing to do with nuclear energy or anything like that. We are looking at the nuclear spin, meaning that the nucleus of an atom will spin in response to a magnetic field, and we can use those particular specific spins that relate to the exact environment in the molecule where that nucleus resides to deduce what atoms that particular one is connected to. And so we are measuring here in nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy the response of the nucleus spin, which we call the nuclear spin, to a magnetic field that it is subjected to. And the information that we glean from looking at those responses of nuclei to magnetic fields is this is going to provide us by interpreting the NMR spectrum information about the connections between atoms in the molecule. So we can determine which hydrogens are connected to which carbons, which carbons are connected to which other carbons, and information such as that, which is very, very powerful in piecing together the complete structure of the molecule. And so the main piece of information that we typically gain from NMR is the connections between the atoms. Super useful because the other two techniques that we talked about that is IR and mass spectrometry. When we talk about the information provided by those, neither of these provide us with information about who's connected to whom. In other words, which atoms are connected together in order to determine a complete structure. Um, certainly by knowing a molecular weight and functional groups, that generally doesn't tell us the complete structure of the molecule because there are many ways that functional groups can be arranged within a compound. And due to the fact that there's a lot of constitutional isomers, a molecule or a particular molecular weight can have a lot of different possible structures. And so generally, these three techniques synergize in order to determine the complete structure of an organic molecule. And so that's what we're working toward over the next couple of weeks is taking these individual bits of information and using those to assemble the complete structure of organic molecules as our grand finale to this. In the next several videos, what we are going to focus on is one at a time looking at IR, MS, and NMR, focusing on how to interpret these types of data. We are not going to get into a lot of depth about the instrumentation used for each of these. That is a topic covered in things like modern analytical chemistry and other upper level coursework. What we're going to focus on instead are practical applications of these data. When you are given or when you collect yourself an IR spectrum, a mass spectrum, or an NMR spectrum, how do you use that to determine the structure of an organic molecule? So in the next video, we'll focus on IR. In later videos, MS and NMR. Stay tuned for that.